It's been a while since we've been on the road to Jekyll Island. So to catch you up to speed, we've already discussed how the Federal Reserve can make its own money out of thin air and how the whole thing was created by the country's wealthiest men. And they were inspired by the Rothschild Central Banking Cartel throughout all of Europe. We also know that this banking cartel's initial headquarters was on a small coastal island in Georgia called Jekyll Island. And we know the room where it all happened was once the site of very violent rituals by a tribe of giants. There's so much to this story and we have barely scratched the surface. So while we're on the supernatural side of things, let's take a deeper look into one of the seven deadly sins, the root of all evil, the worship of money. Greed is one of the seven deadly sins. It has the ability to corrupt to the core. Now the word mammon appears in several translations of the Bible. In the famous Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 24, Jesus speaks of mammon. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up yourselves treasures in heaven there will your heart be also. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold on to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now, in some current translations of the Bible, the word mammon is often replaced for money. But let's dig a little deeper. Mammon is also a Hebrew word for money. But it's not that simple. According to the ultimate source on demonology, De Plancy's Dictionnaire Infernal, Mammon is the evil demon of greed. He's the god of the material, the superficial, and he's Hell's ambassador to England. And with everything that we know about the history of the Bank of England, I'm not too surprised that the evil demon god of greed presides over this country as Lucifer is the evil demon of pride, Mammon represents greed. He's referenced in the Bible and in ancient Babylon. Money is Mammon. Evidence of Mammon the demon can be traced all the way back to 340 BC in Gregory of Nice's writings. In the first century, Bishop Peter Lombard wrote that Mammon is the name of a devil, according to the Syrian tongue. Influential scholar Nicholas de Lira also said that in 1290, that Mammon is the name of a demon. He appears in Milton's Paradise Lost and in the play, The Alchemist, written by Ben Jonson in 1610. With everything that we know so far, another huge question needs to be answered. How did the Jekyll boys get the government on their side? Now, obviously they needed an inside man, not just anybody. They needed the big guy. The year is 1912. The presidential election is neck and neck and neck. That's right. There were three main candidates, Democrat governor of New Jersey and Jekyll boys pick Woodrow Wilson. Next up, we have the incumbent president, Republican William Howard Taft. And the third candidate was from the new progressive Bull Moose Party, ex-Republican president, Teddy Roosevelt. Now, side note, this is the most recent time in history where an ex-president has run for office after his term, which makes me even more curious about the 2024 election. The Jekyll Boys and the Big Bankers were implementing the old Rothschild strategy of war by betting on everyone. Now, incumbent President Taft was on to these bankers. He didn't support the Fed's predecessor, the Aldrich Vreeland plan, and he didn't like that the bankers were starting to get more and more political control. After all, it was the Rothschilds that taught us whoever holds the money holds the power. The writing was on the wall. Taft had to go. J.P. Morgan's agent, George Perkins, who later became a politician, and Frank Muncie convinced Teddy Roosevelt to run for president again, but this time under the new progressive Bull Moose Party. 
You see, they didn't really support Roosevelt. They supported splitting the Republican vote to make way for the pick of the Rockefellers, Jacob Schiff, and Daddy Warbucks. Enter Woodrow Wilson. We already established earlier in this series that political parties don't really matter. Republican, Democrat, they're all just puppets for whoever holds the gold. See, these rich Wall Street bankers scammed the American people by using political parties interchangeably and to their own advantage. No one would have ever suspected that the wealthiest bankers in the world would have ever backed a Democrat. First created as the party of Thomas Jefferson, the party of the working man that was created just a few generations earlier for the specific purpose of opposing a central bank. With the bankers pulling all the strings, Wilson served as the perfect puppet to push the Federal Reserve into law. And before you chalk all this up to conspiracy, let's hear from Wilson's Secretary of State, William McAdoo. The fact is that there is a serious danger of this country becoming a Pluto-democracy. That is a sham republic with the real government in the hands of a small clique of enormously wealthy men who speak through their money. Experience shows that the most practical method of getting a hold of political party is to furnish it with money in large quantities. No discussion about Woodrow Wilson can be complete without talking about his best special friend or America's shadow president. Colonel House. It was House that created all Wilson's first policies. It was House that created all foreign policy. It was House that introduced Wilson to the Federal Reserve Banking Cartel. Born in Texas, educated in England, House would eventually settle down in New York where he would start investing in railroads and banking where he would start to make connections that would last him for the rest of his life. When in New York, House would make good friends with the governor from New Jersey, Woodrow Wilson. From then on, House would become a crucial part of Wilson's administration, even living in the White House with Wilson. It was House that convinced Wilson that America needed to join World War I after the sinking of Lusitania. It was House that drafted the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I, basically creating the League of Nations. It was House that co-created the Council on Foreign Relations with Lord Alfred Milner and the Jekyll Boys. I hope you see how complex this web of characters is starting to get. And again, before anyone comes at me screaming conspiracy, House himself provides the receipts that he was the link between the Jekyll Boys and the White House. In his personal diaries, he records many meetings with Paul Warburg, aka Daddy Warbucks, and Jacob Schiff about currency reform, new currency plans, currency measures, and the currency situation. The bankers were well aware that Wilson had very limited knowledge on finances and they knew they could take advantage of him. Later in his life, Wilson expressed his regrets with signing the Fed into law. I am a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. Great industrial nation is not controlled by its system of credit. We are no longer government by free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and the vote of the majority, a government by the opinion to duress of a small group of dominant men. What's so infuriating is that so many presidents have gone on to speak out against the Federal Reserve, and yet nothing happens. The creature just keeps on growing. Stay tuned, there's a lot more to cover.